That will that never, never work. work. You can't, can't publish that. Seriously? Don't. Don't. Oh, my God. That's bad. 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 You probably should find a job. You ever learn how to spell? Stop. Stop. Quit while you're in the middle. Don't bother me. I've seen good people. Do you really want to shoot? And bro, my third grade, give it up. Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Welcome to Horrible Writing, episode 28. I'm Paul Sading, I'm your host, and yes, we have another wonderful writing writer interview this time around. Writing series gets the serious downloads. You all love that. You love hearing from other people instead of just me. I can understand that because I've been very fortunate to talk to a number of writers who are very giving of their time and their personal stories to help you kind of understand that you're not alone and whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, whatever is interrupting or squashing or com- completely blocking your creativity, that creative spirit, uh, know that you're not alone and there are people who are sharing their stories in this writer ser- writer interview series. Today is no different. Today I have with me uh, one of my heroes of audio drama, Daniel Foytek of The Lift Podcast, Ninth, Studi- Stor- St- Ninth Story Studios, and the Wicked Library, among a million other projects that he has going on, is here with us today. Dan, welcome to Horrible Writing. Well, thanks for having me. I am so pleased and so tickled to uh, get a chance to talk to you. One of the reasons is I have talked to audio dramatists and I've talked to authors, and we've talked about a lot of great things, anxiety, ego, um, Therapy, writing as therapy from Rick Coast, you know him well, and you know, meditation with Susan K. Quinn, all kinds of cool things. One of the things that we haven't touched on yet in the interview series is speaking to other people about something that I personally closely identify with. You're you're the first one I'm gonna get to talk to about this. Um, and I can't wait to pick your brain and see what kind of responses you have for us. So you and I did some chatting before uh we got on air over the past couple of weeks to kind of decide what we were going to talk about. And you mentioned talking about finding your voice, but with this being horrible writing, I don't let you get away with just talking about the craft of writing because we want to get to know you as a person. And then you wowed me. You talked about finding your voice through writing, through collaboration, but in a way that helps you find that voice with it being expanding your understanding of darker tendencies and anger. So right off the bat, because these things can be flashpoints for some people, I want to kind of get a grounding from you. What do you mean when you say uh, darker tendencies or what does Dan's anger look like? (laughs) I don't know. You wouldn't like me whenever I'm angry. Um, (laughs) That might might be an odd reference for people that don't remember the the old Incredible Hulk TV series with Bill Bixby. The the younger group. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that I spend a lot of my time just being very upset about things. Uh, the world's a crazy place, man. We we all know this. And there's a lot of things out there that just piss me off. And I think that as we've evolved in modern society, we have lost kind of some of the social norms and the social niceties. I mean, I, I think that we're very connected through social media and stuff, but I think we're also very disconnected because we don't have conversations anymore. Uh, a lot of things are, are tweets and Facebook posts and, you know, I don't care what people are having for breakfast. I really don't give a shit. Um, but I, what I like and what I miss is, is the conversations, you know, where we can have a discussion of substance. And I think that aside from that, you know, there's, there's a lot of my own anger that stems from, um, maybe my shyness and my social and emotional awkwardness and that type of thing. And whenever I'm out in public, I just don't like people. I don't like being around. I, and I think it's because I feel awkward. You know, it's not, I mm-hmm. like individuals, but I don't like people. Does that make any sense? No, it makes total sense. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and I and I kind of expect a very high level of things from myself, and I get very angry w- with myself when I don't live up to my own expectations. And I think that extends to others as well. You know, like I kind of expect a certain level of professionalism and excellence from myself, and I expect the same from other people. And I have to remind myself quite frequently that you know not everybody is going to work the same way that you do. It doesn't mean that they're not valid and that they're not doing a good job and, and that sort of thing. But I can't expect that somebody else to do what I would do. You know, if I'm going to stay up until three o'clock in the morning working on a show and editing stuff, I can't expect that of somebody else. Um, I can so relate to that, man. It's like you're inside my head. <laughs> it yeah, really is. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I've worked very hard on that through the years and over time to, kind of reach an acceptance and you know it, it, sometimes it just boils down to I've just accepted that when when push comes to shove I need to do it because I'm the only one that I can 100% rely on um you know I don't fault people if they have personal issues and things that are going on in their lives that that absorb them do I get angry? Sure. But, you know, I mean, I understand that that's irrational. It's just as rational as me hating uh, the the character that's played by the actress in that Apple commercial who doesn't know what a fucking computer is. <laughs> uh, sure. Has uh, OK, so how has so how have you throughout your life? I mean, let's talk about, you know, emotionally mature, Dan, um, not the, you know, not, not necessarily, or maybe I shouldn't even restrict you like that. So my apologies, maybe even the angst ridden teenage Dan, but throughout your life, have you always had good coping mechanisms for that? And has writing always been part of that coping technique that you've used? Uh, no. And I still, I don't, I don't know that I still have good coping mechanisms. I'm still chasing, I'm still looking for that. You know I mean? I've tried meditation, which helps somewhat. Uh, I think that my biggest therapy is, is the writing. You know, I, I, I can be myself through my writing. So, you know, where I, I tend to put this wall up with everybody and I don't let them inside. Um, I, I think that my, my soul comes out in my writing. And I think that, you know, my anger is lessened by just being able to spend some time and express myself. Has it, have you seen an evolution in the writing itself? Um, that's, I know that's a really shitty question, so <laughs> I'll, I'll ground it in, in my own experience because you've got me identifying with a lot of what you say. So I have you know a series of questions scripted out and now you're making me think of new ones on the fly. But for me, much like you, the world's a shitty place and I try not to focus on it, but it it is the source of a lot of inspiration. And through my writing journey, I, I've seen an evolution where I've become more creative in how I channel that anger instead of scathing 14 page monologues for a character. I can actually tell a story, weave a story around that inspiration that comes from darker thoughts I have or the those angry tendencies. So I'm wondering, has that been a similar experience for you or have you always been able to tap into um the anger or those darker things when you see something that really pisses you off and for a flash of a second you just want to do violence against somebody Mm -hmm. um yeah i mean you know it helps with writing darker characters right because we have these ideas that occur to us that we would never actually engage in uh but the character that you're writing that is an asshole can do those things with uh you know with no re- with no regard for anybody else um so i mean i don't know i mean just for some writers that's kind of fantasy and and being able to um delve into those darker places and and, and i think we all have you know darkness in us in some fashion you know it's just how dark is it right mm-hmm. um but yeah, I mean, I think that you know, over time, it's evolved. It's I, I'm more aware of it now. It's uh, it's something that I can channel, um, and and I think that that's really our job as artists is we're supposed to hold a mirror up to the world. And I think that that's why so many of us. I mean, there's the stereotypical depressed, angry, angst ridden artist, and I, I don't think that I think it's a stereotype for a reason because I think that a lot of us we see the world differently. We see a lot of people get caught up in the trappings, you know, and they don't see behind the curtain and, you know, things kind of fly by you. But I think whenever you're an artist, I think what makes you an artist and makes you want to write or sculpt or paint or draw or whatever your medium is that you use to tell your stories. I think that where that comes from is you see the world and 
you have to do something with what you see because not every it's 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 like peeking around a corner and seeing something that nobody else sees you know it's i think we all struggle with that and uh, it's it brings a lot of things to us you know from depression to anger um and and so on you know having said that and, and tapping into that um in regards to finding your voice one of the things that a lot of writers struggle with is finding our voice and being comfortable with our voice so i may be projecting onto you so if i am i apologize but i again not to beat a dead horse, I do identify with the darker tendencies slash anger theme of what we're talking about here. So if we're to find our voice to really make our writing sing, was that an easy journey for you if your voice is coming from these darker thoughts in the, in this anger that you have? I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's for me, I think that finding finding your voice, I think, is more than just like a lot of people refer to it as like, you know, you have to write and write and write until you sound true until you don't sound trite or like somebody else. Um, And for me, I think a lot of that has been, it's more than just the writing. It's knowing who I am and, and accepting what my limitations are and accepting, you know, I still have a hard time accepting what are purportedly my strengths. Uh, I have a huge case of imposter syndrome where I struggle to accept somebody says, Oh, you did that. And that's great. I'm like, oh, well, I see all the flaws in it, but okay, great, I, I guess. Um, but, I, you know, in, in terms of how that comes to writing, I mean, in the process of doing the writing and doing a lot of soul searching over the years and accepting, you know, that I do have these anger issues and, and how do I deal with them, um, my voice is knowing who I am. And because I know who I am now, I can write as myself. I don't know if that makes sense or not. No, it it does to me. And I, you know, again, with this aim being thematic for each interview that I do, it will appeal to those uh, those folks who, uh, you know, experience this, who can relate to this. And that's kind of what I want to do. I feel sometimes that those tropes and those or those stereotypes that are cast upon people who may have uh, darker tendencies, you know, it kind of also puts us into a corner where we're not so readily you know accepted maybe and that may not even be the right word so everything that you say um hey i'm all on board with because i want to reach out to those people who (laughs) who do want to explore that part because that's the part of them that's screaming to to the world i know it did for me was it like that for you did you ever try to like not capture that genie in the bottle or was it for you always just you know full bore what what was in your head just always was able to come out well, you know, if I had the last 20 years back, I'd probably have uh, had a lot more stuff published because I walked away, <laughs> I walked away from writing for about 20 years. And, you know, I, I when I got back into it, I was like, why did I stop doing this? This was kind of my my thing. You know, it was, it, it's it's how I knew who I was. And, you know, since I've gotten back into it and, and gotten into talking to a lot of other storytellers and, and exploring, you know, storytelling in general, um, I've, I've kind of come back into that. And, you know, I, I recently watched, I don't know if you've ever seen this, there's a, a great little series that uh, has been out for years, but it, Netflix just picked it up. Um, and it's uh, Jerry Seinfeld's Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. I have not and, watched it yet, but I did see it. Yeah. And, and one of the things, I mean, throughout the series, they talk a lot about comedy and the craft and, uh, you know, that craft. And it's all storytelling to me. Um, but they talk about, you know, you look at some of these comedians like Brian Regan and Jerry Seinfeld, and they seem to be very goofy and, and happy-go-lucky. But what you find out in watching them talk is that all of this is driven by just anger. Um, you know, it's like I can't remember who the comedian was. I think it may have been um, uh, Bill Burr that was saying, you know, when Brian Regan tells this silly joke and he's all clean and, and it's all goofy, I bet you that wasn't his reaction when he was actually in that situation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it kind of made me realize that a lot of what – what I do and a lot of what the people that I know do, a lot of that is driven by just frustration and anger with the way the world is and the way that things are. And it's our way of expressing it and coming to terms with it. And no, and that, and that makes sense. So that's what, what goes into what I wanted to ask you next is about that headspace. A lot of people, I, I feel some of the struggling writers that I've spoken to who have, they don't, 
necessarily want to go write a romance. They don't want to go write a, a, you know, even a high fantasy. They tend to, you know, they'll go to the grim dark. They'll go to the urban dystopic fantasy type stuff or horror, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of them break down in the process. And I don't know if it's a, is if it's a comfort level or not, that's, you know, that takes a long time on the couch to figure those kind of things out for you. Is it easy and this may be the wrong way to structure the question, but is it easy for you to get into that headspace to to when you sit at that keyboard, put your hands on the on the keys? Is it easy for you to get into that headspace uh, to write, or are you writing because you're in that headspace? It depends. I mean, writing is a job, so you have to write through all kinds of things, and and I think that's one of the cool things about writing. I, I really enjoy writing short stories. Um, I have a novel that I worked on and it's sitting somewhere about halfway done. But I mean, I really, I, I have too short of an attention span. Um, I like the short story because it's, 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 it's contained. Uh, and whenever I write, as I write, you know, this version and then the next draft and, and you work through it, you're coming to it as almost kind of different people because one day I might be angry because of this or another day I might be in a good mood. Another day I might be depressed or sad and you write through that. Um, and the cool thing about writing successive drafts is you kind of get these layers that come into it because you're coming to it from a different space each time. But regardless of where my head is, it's just sitting down and actually doing it. And, uh, you know, for me, music is a big thing. I, I like to listen to uh, music that makes me remember the way that I was feeling when I was thinking about the story or when the idea first occurred to me. So um, that helps a lot for me. Okay. So is your, is your fiction, let, let's look at your, you know, the spec fiction that you do create and that maybe a lot of people are familiar with. So is that driven by these tendencies and these darker thoughts, this anger, or is it like in response to it for you or, or is that a mix as well? I think it's a mix. Um, I mean, you know, we can talk about, uh, the lift, you know, I mean, because that's something that is a lot more from, from me. Um, whereas the wicked light, well, I mean, the lift too has a lot of other writers that are involved in it, but you know, the, the world itself was something that, you know, I created along with Cindy and, and through a lot of long conversations about, you know, it would be nice if there were consequences for people's actions. Um, and you know, there are these, there's this long history of folk and fairy tales where they're all cautionary tales. I mean, fairy tales are the first horror, um, and it's it's basically, you know, if you do bad shit, bad shit's going to happen to you. So, you know, you better watch out and behave yourself. And that appeals to me because I think that a lot of times in society today, there is no consequence and people can say and do whatever they want with impunity. And I don't like that. So, you know, there's 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 hope to me in learning how to be a better person. And, um, you know, that includes me trying to control the anger that I feel sometimes and, you know, <laughs> wanting to bash my head against the wall or, uh, you know, whatever, you know, whenever I get to that point of frustration. I think that's a, you know, that's a really interesting comment that I think is going to catch a lot of people, especially uh, those listeners who aren't necessarily familiar with you right now, but they will be after they check out some of your stuff. Uh, but for them to hear you talk about hope, <laughs> when the central topic is about your darker thoughts and your anger. <laughs> but I relate to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a desire for that. And and I think that we're all frustrated that there, you know, one of the things that frustrates me too in, in modern society is trial by Twitter. You know, it's it's kind of like somebody says something, it gets taken out of context. And, and before anything can be done about it, people have already made up their mind. And I don't like that. But yeah. You know, um, yeah, I mean, and you know, it's it's like, you know, what we were talking about, you know, kind of the, the stereotypes and, and that type of thing. One of the things for people that write darker things is, you know, that guy must be really messed up. Um, and, and I've in doing the Wicked Library and working with so many speculative fiction and horror writers, they're the nicest, warmest, most giving, kindest people I know. And I think that's because they get all that garbage out. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of other people just hold it in and they're just a rage machine. Uh, I think I'm, I'm a lot more balanced now that, you know, I have an outlet to, you know, write a missive about something and, and, and bury it in story. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's the cool thing about story is, you know, that's, that's how we really get to know each other and how we really communicate to each other because, 
you know, it happens when you're not thinking about it. You're being entertained, but in the background, there's something more going on. Do you feel, and this is more Paul asking Dan instead of, you know, interview question, do you feel almost a sense of fulfillment that through, okay, so not only do you have the cathartic process of through story, you're, you're processing your own anger or your own frustrations, your own darker thoughts, et cetera, but through that, you're able to maybe influence people, maybe get people to think and consider a different perspective about something that you've got buried in one of your stories. Does that provide you with a sense of fulfillment? Is that something you've never come across, never experienced? It does. I mean, it's 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 very humbling because, um, you know, especially with the lift, it's it's something that it p- tends to touch people on a very personal level. And, you know, I, I've gotten iTunes reviews where people say, you know, it helped them deal with the loss of a child or, you know, I've had people that have reached out to me and, and I, you know, one person in particular who I won't name. And she said, you know, I'd like to talk to you because your stories have helped me with therapy and things that I've gone through in my life and it's brought it to the surface. And by talking about this situation that this character was in, it helped me talk to my therapist about it. And, you know, people saying that, you know, it made them one, there's one review where somebody said, you know, it made them look at life differently and it made them look at this specific situation. And I think that's what we're all trying to do through our stories is reach someone and and give them an idea. And I'm amazed that it actually worked. Um, So yeah, it's very fulfilling whenever you, your intended goal is is achieved and that you know you touch someone emotionally um and you can you can take them through this dark journey and at the end you know they're they're left with this warm this warm feeling because something has been resolved i'm going to actually get into the lift here in a second because i have a specific question about that but i was also thinking while you were saying that um about your writing style in in the context of what you just said about trial by Twitter, I absolutely love that phrase, by the way, for one. <laughs> I think that's a genius phrase. But as someone myself who geeks out on uh, writing darker stuff, and, and I found the more I write, the darker it gets. I just, in December, I spent all of December writing a new novel I'm going to release for next December, and it's 12, 12 short stories. And all of them are, you know, along the Clive Barker line of just really fucked up type of stuff that I want to do with them. And I felt really fulfilled. I felt an evolution as a writer doing that. For you, dealing with anger, dealing with the dark tendencies, dark thoughts, do you self-edit in your art to, I don't, (laughs) conform has so much baggage to it. I don't like that word. But, you know, to, to... to meet the market where it is for the type of stories that you're writing, do you self-censor yourself or do what we hear? Is that Dan in his truest form of inspiration? Um, I think that you're, what you hear is who I am now. Um, you know, I mean, there, there, my, I think whenever we write or we create whatever we're creating, you know, we work through it and we stumble a lot on our way to where we want to go. Um, I mean, I have a certain level of confidence now that what I'm writing is, is what I really want to say. Um, and you know, if I look back at some of my older stuff, like I mentioned, uh, half a novel that's sitting, you know, there's some really dark characters in there that I wouldn't feel comfortable putting out there today because it was not necessarily that, I'm embarrassed of them or or what they're doing, but just that like it was a clumsy attempt to try to get a point across and I can do it a lot more subtly now. Um, You know, you don't have to have, you don't have to see the monster. Um, It's, it's better if you, you know, the monsters there and you hear the monster in the background and you know, things like that are going on, but you don't necessarily have to see it on screen. Um, I mean, there's, I I don't have a problem with, you know, things that are gory or bloody or, or that type of thing. But at the same time, I also kind of think that for me, at least, as I've written more and it's evolved, I can be more subtle. I don't necessarily have to be so hardcore about it. I can kind of hint at things instead. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that makes sense. So let's get let's get to the, the subtleness, the real art for me. And you already kind of played on it a little bit. Um, but and you know this, you and I have had extensive conversations for. Uh, nearly two and a half years now, because both of our first, show, well, my first audio drama came out about the same time the lift did, um, and I kind of 
grew up with you, basically, in audio drama. So, when... Yet it's the from, first time we've ever actually spoken. Isn't that crazy? It's, 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 it's crazy, man. It's this crazy. is a foul for both of us, by the way. Yeah, I mean, it's it's weird. I mean, that's what's, I guess, cool and also strange about the way that the world works today is that you can get to know somebody and, and collaborate with them without actually having a conversation, as I talked about earlier, it's, where it's you, so you, get, you really get to know someone and you never actually have to speak. So it's, you know, in all that time, this will be the first time that we've actually had a, a, a real conversation. It um, is so strange. It is. <laughs> well, you know, I've got a, a guy who works in Fate Crafters with me, and uh, him and I have known each other through podcasting for years. I'm actually going to visit him this summer when we're in England, and it'll. And we just spoke last fall for the first time ever, and, and he predates my audio drama days. He was a listener of mine on Talk Podcast I had years ago, and wow. it was only until last fall that we actually spoke. But I mean, I, I consider him a friend, and I'm, I can't wait to meet him. Uh, in the summer when we get over to England. It is. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So with this, um, I'm really curious what happened with you and how this developed because I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay some praise on you. So please be as humble as you possibly can and as accepting as you can. I know you'll be humble. You'll probably be too humble. And, and that's kind of what I meant to actually say is, you know, try to reserve your, your own humility because we talk about these things and and you drive you've created an incredibly rich story but more importantly a, a world that can ground us immediately with so many contributing writers mm-hmm. each one feels related to the other um they're they're distinct voices but they're not they're, there's no shocking jarring distinction where you don't feel like the story that you're hearing now isn't true to the central tenant you have you know we've we've talked for a little bit now about darker tendencies and angers but and i've said this to you a number of times i've said this publicly a number of times i think and i still stand by this almost three years after i heard her for the first time but i honestly genuinely feel you've created the strongest character in audio drama the most prominent the most profound the most vivid character in audio drama and then you do it with contributing writers it's it's just a very strange thing that i i really admire because i don't know how you do it but what i'd like to do is um kind of get to an idea of your process through this anger through these darker tendencies and how that relates to victoria now listeners um i hope you do after this interview you go check out the lift you can start i i highly encourage you to go all the way back to the very beginning of the show and start with the uh, first episode and you'll meet a young lady with a very um complex backstory and you know she just tears at your friggin' heartstrings and she walks this line dan and i don't know how you do it but she walks this line between um being altruistic and kind-hearted and empathetic to um the very very she can she can be very concrete and she can be distant at times and and you know she's even had darker tendencies herself so walk me through the the creation of victoria and the world of the lift as it relates to what we've been talking about, those darker thoughts and that anger. Well, um, <laughs> Victoria, I mean, there are certain things to this. I mean, um, I think she's real. Um, I think that she's existed out there in the ether for a long time and she was looking for an outlet. And uh, I was lucky enough to, uh, to start to write about her. Uh, she revealed herself to me very slowly over time and um, she's become this very rich character because I think because so many people have written her um, and because the lift takes place in a jumbled timeline where, you know, you're not always getting her at, you know, nine years old or a hundred years old or a thousand years old or however old she happens to be in the story. We bounce around in the timeline a lot. So you get different aspects of her and you can kind of see how she evolves and changes And like I said, because so many people have brought um, parts of themselves to her and the story. And, you know, I have this theory that she kind of whispers in their ears and tells them how to write and what to say. And no, I wouldn't say that. I'd say this instead. Um, It's made her this very complex 
character and it's made her this 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 thing not this thing but this person who's alive uh because we are all very complex and we all have all these many facets we have our our dark parts and our anger and we have you know i think most of us are good people that's the way that we're able to survive in society you know because we we trust that when we're driving down the road that someone's not just going to turn their car and crash into us. We trust that someone's not going to sneak in through our window at night and stab us. You know, we have a lot of trust in in each other. And I think that for the most part, we're good people. People are usually decent and good for the most part. Um, and so Victoria has that, you know, she wants to help people. She wants to um, do the right thing. But there are times when, you know, uh, you you can't go that route because someone is either too dark. They they're they're too much in. They don't want to change. They don't want to be good. Or you know, it's uh, it, they've made the wrong choice. They choose not to embrace the better half of themselves. Um, and that's really what we try to do with the show is you know is show you that you should embrace the embrace the better half of yourself, and that if you don't there probably are going to be consequences. So, you know, when we, we started thinking about how everything was built and and the time frame and when she died and all that type of thing, it it was uh, every piece kind of led into the next. And um, I I have to give a lot of credit to the writers that have written for the show because, you know, Cindy and I spent a lot of time kind of talking about who she was and we came up with, you know, you've written for the show. So, you know, you got a bundle that told you basically here's all the floors in the building. Here's what each floor represents. You know, here's Victoria's history. Here's who she is. So, you know, we've given some, we've given people things to draw on. Um, and as the show goes on and gets more episodes, I think it becomes easier for people to write her because they have kind of this, this history in the back to go behind it. Um, you know, we had our, our two pilot episodes. So we have our, core stories which explore victoria and her world and who she is and her path and her journey and then we have the visitor of the the week stories where you know they they're she's working with somebody who comes to the building and she's guiding them uh to hopefully their better destiny um and our very first true episode after the pilots was a pretty dark episode because we had a character who uh you know again it's the subtleties it doesn't occur on screen but there's some dark things that is in this character's past that are in this character's past. And, you know, Victoria is, we're introduced to her in that first episode. This is the first time she's had to punish someone or, you know, lock someone away and say, you know, there's no hope for you. This is where you're going to stay. Uh, And she struggles with that a little bit, but she accepts what she has to do. And I think that that's, you know, for all of us, you know, we, Anybody who's a parent, uh, I'm not a parent, but I, you know, I have, I know people who are parents, obviously. And, you know, sometimes you have to be, you have to discipline your children. You have to tell them, you know, if, if, uh, things, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, there are consequences for it. And my parents did that very well with me. And, you know, I think that that's, it hurts and nobody wants to do it. Um, but you have to, and, I don't know. Did that answer your question? I think I danced it, around it. <laughs> well, it, it's a complex question because I mean, she's she's a complex character. I mean, she is so layered. Um, but it it does. I wonder. Do, has how do you feel? Has she made you a better, not only a better writer, but a better person? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, that's that's where this all started. Was you know, I mean, I did a, a podcast called Ninth Story Podcast, which was me talking to storytellers of all types and. Victoria was kind of a mascot in the background and she grew in influence and more prominent, became more prominent as the show went on. And and I always say that, you know, she's as much, my, I'm as much her creation, if not more her creation than she is mine because writing her and getting to know her and, 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 you know, listening to her whisperings has changed me and, made me i think a storyteller and which is what i always wanted to be so and, and i can see that how okay so I, I i do want to talk about your horrible writing experience but before we get to that <laughs> I, I want to uh talk, ask about collaboration and how that has helped um with your development of your voice do your have you do you deliberately construct your teams uh to 
for people to match your your perspective or do you guys have some sort of secret sauce behind the scenes where you've got this complimentary blend what what is it about collaboration that uh works so well for you well i uh, i couldn't do all this myself um i do a lot of it um you know i mean from the the mixing to you know in, initially all the music and you know, then we got composers involved, but so so many hands makes light work. I, I, I it would not be possible to do this show without a bunch of really good people that you know are are passionate about writing her and 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 being in that world and playing in that world. Um, I got very lucky uh, that through doing the Wicked Library, which I took over from my good friend Nelson Piles, or sorry, author name Nelson W. Piles. Um, so I took over you know that from Nelson and. In doing that, it was kind of my my first exposure to horror and uh, that world, and, and it, I found very quickly that it was very appealing to me. Um, and I met some really great writers that I admired a lot, and I was able to kind of, you know, use that as the stepping stone to say, you know, hey, I have this other thing I'm working on uh, that we want to launch, and I think you would be a great writer for this piece. So we very, very carefully handpicked a lot of our writers. Um, all of our writers were handpicked. I mean, we have not until going into season three, we have opened up the possibility of having a fan write an episode, you know, so listener that might be a fan of the show who also enjoys writing could write a story and, you know, have that become an episode of the show. But it's taken us three seasons to get to that because I felt that it was very important and, and Cindy would agree that, you know, we wanted to make sure that we very carefully managed the way that the world was and kept everything consistent and, you know, have a lot of respect for, you know, Victoria as a character and, and her world and also for all the writers, because, you know, at the end of the day, the goal here is to introduce the listeners to authors that have other work out there that they can go out and buy. You know, if you like author a, I don't want to, I mean, I can't name everybody, so I'm not going to name anybody, right. but if you, you know, if you, if you like author, if you like, if you like Cindy's work, well, I can say Cindy and me. So if you like Cindy's work, you know, there's other stuff out there. If, if you like my work, there's other stuff out there. Not so much for the two of us, um, because we spend so much time editing and, and putting the show together that I don't think we write quite as much as we would like to, but you know, there's definitely work out there by Paul Sading, who was uh, an author for the show. Um, there's definitely other work out there by John Grills. There, everybody who comes to the show, for the most part, has other stuff out there. And at the end of the day, that's what we like to do is to say, you know, as my thanks to this person for coming and playing in this world, go out and buy their stuff because they have other stuff out there or listen to their podcast or, you know, go out and listen to their music or whatever it happens to be. Get their artwork. Um, we have so many people that... Um, have come together to make this something really special. And uh, I think, you know, I, I like to, I mean, luck is, is kind of a, you make your own luck is what they say. Right. But I mean, I, I feel that we truly have been very lucky that we've had so many talented people um, that said yes to being involved in the show. I'm going to put you on the spot because you've been kind enough to come on to horrible writing, share your experiences, help talk through, some listeners through what they may be going through that might actually prevent them from sharing their stories with the world. Um, to, and I, I think that's so critical. I know I'm biased as someone who really digs the darker stories. I know I am. Um, I don't want to see sunshine and roses in my stories because that's what appeals to me as a reader. But I also, I've talked to so many, uh, horror writers or thriller writers or grim dark writers who don't because it's vulnerable enough to write as it is but there's something about putting th those darker things out there uh maybe it's one of the dynamics of the world we live in today but i really appreciate you coming on and talking about these things and trying to help those people who may be throttling themselves back uh, to encourage them to not and encourage them to get their art out there. I appreciate it so much that I want to put you on the spot and ask you to share a horrible writing experience that you have had. So if you're a first time listener, the whole deal behind this is I invite these wonderful writers on the show. They open up their lives and their world to us. And then I ask them to share something even more awkward and possibly embarrassing to them. But the catch is that these wonderful people come on and they share these experiences 
on air with you in hopes that it encourages you. Something they've lived through, something that may be horrible, something that may be embarrassing, something that may be just humiliating, but they picked up uh, where they left off. They pl- they marched on and they got something creative out into the world. So Dan, what was your horrible writing experience? Wow. Um, <clears throat> I've had so many horrible writing experiences, you know I mean? From, <laughs> from, from the, the very basic, you know, um, it just, the story just doesn't work. And sometimes that's the case and you walk away from it, or sometimes you put it away and you come back to it and you push through it. But, um, I don't know. I mean, I think that probably my, my most, <sighs> okay. So I had, before I did, um, before I did the lift, I had a little project that I had just to kind of force myself to, to get back into writing and to get back into storytelling. Um, and I did something called the ride, which was a, um, Victoria is, is in it kind of in passing, um, as who she was in the building. When I originally started ninth story podcast, she's just kind of, you know, a character that's occurring there. But if you look at it, which I hope none of you will, um, <laughs> you, you'll see that it has the roots of what eventually became, um, the lift and, you know, I mean, even the term the lift is, is double meaning. I like things that have more than one meaning. So the lift is not just an elevator, but it's also lifting yourself up and, you know, trying to get these characters to a better place. Uh, so at any rate, I, I, I decided I wanted to uh, get back into writing. And I wrote this, this piece kind of the way that radio writers used to write, where you write the show one day and you perform everything maybe later that night or the next day. So there's not a lot of editing that goes into it. Um, you just kind of fly on the seat of your pants and, and what happens happens. And sometimes there's magic to that. And most of the time there's not. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's out there. It's, it's hard to find um, on purpose, but I've never taken it away or taken it down. It's um, my horrible experience is that I actually put this thing together and I recorded it and I put it out into the world and it's still out there. Um and it's probably one of the, one of the worst things that I've ever written. Um, there's a lot of emotion in it because, you know, I was coming to terms with a, a kind of a repressed memory, and uh, you know, losing um, a, a, a child to, uh, um, well, you know, she was never born. Uh, so the, there's, you know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of pain and angst in there, and it was something that. Uh, I had tucked away for a very long time to the point where even I wasn't aware of this memory. Um, and, you know, whenever you, you you deal with things like that, a lot of stuff comes out. And sometimes it's very messy and very sloppy. Um, and because of the way that I was writing and recording this, it's all out there and it's very awkward, stilted, crazy form. Um, but it was something that I needed to go through and get past in order to get back into writing and finding out who I was and, and dealing with all these issues. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I guess my horrible writing experience is that I wrote this and it's uh, still out there somewhere. <laughs> oh, once you put it out into the world, it's always, always out there. <laughs> well, I mean, I could take all these episodes down, but they're, they're out there. You know, if somebody wants to dig deep enough, they'll find them. <laughs> well, I, I do want to, uh, seriously, I want to thank you for that. I mean, I, I didn't realize that I'm sorry for your loss. And I think that's, um, it's really, really kind of you to share that part of your story to, to really give folks the full context of what was behind that horrible writing experience. Folks, it, the, the fact is, is if you go, when, because I know you're going to you're going to trust me on this when you go listen to the lift um you're going to see why I hold it in such high regard and give it a couple episodes so you can get a full taste of the entire world and the entire story and the structure and just uh, everything about it I've never I have never been a fan of anthologies because I really inve- I'm a character centric writer myself I I care about the characters the plot is secondary. It's things that happen to the people that I fall in love with. And that's one of the pieces of magic of The Lift is even as an anthology, a collaborative anthology, you still fall in love with the world. I don't know how you all do it as a team, but it's abs- it's absolutely, even after you explained it, it's absolutely remarkable. But for listeners, you know, uh, Dan just showed, you know, you can put something out there into the world that years later, um, 
is not something you're proud of. It's not something you, that you'll point people to. And yet he's still a success. Uh, the lift is, um, arguably one of the strongest things you're going to find out there. I, Dan, do you even consider it audio drama? Yeah. I mean, I call it an audio drama. I mean, in my opinion, it is an audio drama. I mean, I know there's different opinions on that, but yeah. to me, if it's, if it's, if it's a drama and it, it takes place in audio form, then by definition, it's an audio drama. You know, people like to try to pigeonhole that down to, well, it has to be like a radio play or, you know, it has to be this. I think that, you know, if it's done in a way, it, what makes it unique, in my opinion, is that it's kind of a blend. So it's you're getting, you know, kind of uh, a narrated story with music and, and effects, but you're also getting, you know, Victoria speaks in her own voice. So, you know, she is is not me reading her voice like you would if you're reading audiobook narration. And, and that's changed a little bit. I mean, I know that there's audiobook narration now where, you know, they, they have, uh, you know, if it's a male narrator, if there's female characters, you'll get female voices for those, which makes it a little bit easier to, to get deep into. But yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, in my opinion, it's an audio drama because it's an audio format and it's drama. No, it makes sense to me. I just didn't want to like miscategorize. No, 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 no. To you at all. But yeah, so folks, I mean, you know, you heard what he said about the ride. Go check out the lift and you'll see. I, even through the darker stuff that we've shared uh, in this episode that Dan was kind enough to come on and talk about, to be able to still be vulnerable with the world, the world that sometimes you reject, uh, sometimes maybe rejects you, you can still be vulnerable with it. There's still beautiful exchanges that happen and it's a fulfilling journey. So please don't let those kind of things stop you. Don't take my word for it. Listen to what Dan just shared on this episode. So Dan, now that uh, everyone has fallen in love with who you are as a human being, <laughs> let them know how they can find you and what you want them to find. Well, I mean, my my two projects are um, the Wicked Library and the Lift, and the Wicked Library is more of a traditional anthology. Um, we have started to work with a lot of different voice actors. Uh, the first season that I did, I did everything kind of like a, a narrator um, and doing some dramatic act i mean i'm i have an acting background so there's dramatic reading to it it's more than just okay so bob goes down to the streets and he does that no so i mean there's a lot more to it we had music it's it's an enhanced experience but um it's really a mixed bag it's a lot darker than the lift is uh and it's truly a horror podcast we explore horror in all of its different genres so you get a lot of different things and and that's what i liked about it is, and what I wanted to do with it when I took it over was to say, you know, there's so many diff different types of horror or from from ghost stories to, uh, you know, slasher to, you know, all the different types of, of horror genres that there are out there, splatterpunk, etc. And I wanted to kind of explore all of that and give people exposure to something that maybe they didn't know that they liked uh, or an author that they'd never met or, or read before. So, you know, that that is truly a, a vehicle to. Uh, expose you to new independent writers i mean we've had some big names on there neil gaiman was was one of the writers that gave me a story that i was allowed to do for season six of uh the wicked library so you know there's we've had some big names on the show but we also do uh, a lot of independent horror writers that you know maybe don't have a big publishing house behind them um and you know we have uh our character the librarian who we've we've done some crossovers with the lift and uh, we're going to be starting a new series that's going to be uh, a special series just for uh, our supporters on Patreon. And, and we're, we're testing out uh, a membership platform for the Wicked Library. So there's going to be some, some cool, good stuff that people can get uh, of, above and beyond what we normally do. Uh, and then, of course, there's The Lift, which we talked a lot about today. Um, not quite as dark. That's more of like a a twilight zone. I mean, there are some episodes that get a little darker, but usually not too bad. Um, I don't know that, you know, I would let my children listen to it if I had children of a certain age, but you know, it, it's, it's, um, it depends. I mean, I guess it depends upon the level of maturity and you know, like anything, you should listen to it first before you let your children listen. Right. <laughs> you would hope <laughs> you would think um but yeah i mean the um you know the the, the wicked library actually had uh won a parsec award this year um one of the writers who's written for both the lift and the wicked library by the name of kb goddard um you know for uh the wicked library we won best speculative fiction story small cast short form 
which is basically just a way of saying it's a short story um, with not too many voices. Um, and then for the lift, we also were a, a finalist for the same category for her story, The Lost Library. And, uh, you know, it's cool that we, we uh, and the Wicked Library also uh, won, or not won, but was a finalist for the uh, Best Anthology uh, magazine. And I think what, what makes the two different in some way is that, you know, with the Wicked Library, it's, it's truly an anthology. And I like to see the lift more as like a collection uh, mm-hmm. because it's, it's a lot of different stories. But you have a common thread that pulls through with Victoria. And it's, in, in my estimation, it's a lot like the X-Files where you had uh, the alien story that was the, the overarching plot. But you had the monster of the week type of thing. And we kind of follow the same format for the lift. So uh, you get a taste of both. When uh, can we expect some new stuff coming out on uh, those? Eh, whenever I get around to it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I was hoping I was going to lock you in on a date. <laughs> no, actually, uh, the uh, the Wicked Library is, should be out February 13th is our, our air date for first episode of season eight. And we are going to actually be doing a full-on traditional radio play type audio drama, uh, which is something we've never done on the Wicked Library before. So that will be the first episode. Uh, it's a great story written by... A gentleman by the name of Christopher Long, and we have several voice actors that are involved, sound effects, a musical score, the whole nine yards. Um, And then, you know, we have some really great stories planned with some voice actors that people may have heard from another podcast where apparently it's uh, hard to sleep at night. Um, (laughs) But, you know, David Cummings and and the folks over at No Sleep are good friends. So uh, we we have uh, collaboration with some of the voice actors uh, from, from that show. And uh, David Alt has been in the lift before. He's also been on the Wicked Library several several times. Uh, the lift should be coming out. Uh, I believe we're we're looking for around February twentieth is our is our goal date right now for the beginning of season three. Um, and then the lift will be an episode a month this this year, unless we get a little more support on Patreon. And then you know we'll we'll do more episodes. Twenty twenty some episodes is is, is tough, man. Oh no! You yeah, you don't do. I cannot judge you on that. You guys <laughs> put out robust episode or robust yeah. seasons. You really do. And I'm getting old, man. I'm 46 now. You know, and it's <laughs> I, I need to. I, and I, you know, it's, I, I want to write. I want to do other things. I want to spend time petting my dog. Um, <laughs> so you. so we we decided we and Cindy moved. You know, from from Pittsburgh to Indiana, and then from Indiana to uh, South Carolina. So things have just been in flux a lot. So you know, I would rather put out 10 episodes that are great than 20 episodes that are so-so or mediocre. Um, the integrity of the show is always the most important thing to us. So yeah. we don't do it very often, but there are times when we're like, okay, well, you know what? We're, we're going to reschedule this and, and do this next month instead of this month because it serves the story. And, you know, I mean, I, I would rather not put an episode out than put something out that I'm not proud of. Well, and I think the marketplace has matured enough where you, where you have that allowance. And, and yeah. that's a great thing. It really is. You know, yeah, I mean, where you can get away breaks with doing and that. I needed a break. You know, I mean, at the end of the season, I always need a break. So we, we usually, I think this this might be the longest. We took three months, I believe, off uh, from both shows just because I needed to, like, play some video games and, and drink some beer and just, like, sit around in my living room and stare at the <laughs> wall, um, you know, cut my toenails, whatever. I mean, I just needed, I needed to do something that was not in this room. <laughs> <laughs> so you heard that here first on Horrible Writing, that during the season of the Wicked Library or the Lift, Dan Foytek does not clip his toenails. Not at all. <laughs> An not exclusive. Even once. <laughs> yeah. They get, it's like Fu Manchu, man. They get really long. <laughs> they curl. Uh, it's shoot. awesome. All right, Dan. So where can people go to actually go find out more information about these awesome shows? And what about if they are, happen to be out on social media and they want to track you down? Well, uh, social media is pretty easy. It's it's at at the Wicked Library and at Victoria's Lift. The Lift was already taken, um, and then uh, the website again. The Lift was already taken, so it's Victoria's Lift dot com, and the Wicked Library is the Wicked Library dot com. Pretty simple. All right, Dan. I want to thank you one more time for coming on and talking because again. Um, You've been an audio drama hero of mine anyways, but Aww. this I think this topic is very important. Maybe, again, you're seeing Paul's bias for horror writers and p- people of my my kind of people, uh, but it, it was very important to have you on and hear your perspective on these things, uh, and, I, and I'm making you late for the gym, so you gave up all this time, and you're giving up more of your time. I really do appreciate this. That's okay, Paul. I don't mind being fat. 
<laughs> I've been fat for a lot longer than I've been skinny, so it's all right. <laughs> hey, but I don't want to enable anything that right. you don't right. find as healthy behaviors. <laughs> That's right. Uh, thanks again, man. <laughs> Absolutely. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse at Writing Horrible and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less. Suck less.